Uh, first of all, before uh, we get going, I want to thank our sponsors, uh, including the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, White Castle, uh, the Columbus Foundation, UBS, and uh, the Japan Foundation in New York, and all of our other festival sponsors uh, for allowing us to be here today, uh, and also for making everything free, uh, which is part of our mission. All right. So, uh, for our second talk of the day, uh, please allow me to introduce Susan Kirtley, who is a professor of English and director of comic studies at Portland State University. Uh, her research interests include visual rhetoric and graphic narratives, and she has published pieces on comics for the popular press and academic journals. She's author of the Eisner winning Linda Berry, Girlhood Through the Looking Glass, uh, and co-editor of With Great Power Comes Great Pedagogy, <laughs> Teaching, Learning, and Comics. You guys know that quote? <laughs> um, her book, Typical Girls, The Rhetoric of Womanhood in Comic Strips, was the 20, 2022 Charles Hatfield Prize winner uh, for the best book in comic studies. She is currently an associate editor of Inks, the Journal of Comic Studies Society. Um, so go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. It's uh, always an honor and a pleasure to be here every year I say, Jay, Ben, please, may I, may I come back? I love coming to this festival in the Billy Ireland. Uh, I'm Susan Kirtley, again, uh, uh, Director of Comic Studies and Composition at Portland State. And I'm, I think I'm one of the luckiest people in the world because I get to, as my job, talk about comics all day. It's the job like I dreamed of in middle school. So I feel very <laughs> lucky uh, to have the opportunity to be here with you. Um, I studied, com I studied uh, rhetoric and I read comics and it wasn't until um, fairly late in my academic career that I started doing both. Um, and I started teaching with comics uh, when I was in my first tenure line position. And I remember someone saying to me, do you want to get fired? <laughs> and I was like, actually, no. Um, but over time, I've incorporated comics more and more into my teaching. And as I've done so, I've uh, learned a lot more about comics pedagogy, and I've worked with uh, collaborators um, in the <coughs> Middle of the Comics Studies program at Portland State, uh, and really been thinking through uh, how do we use comics. So today, for the next like 45 minutes-ish, 40 minutes, a couple of goals. And by the way, I'm going to ask you guys to work, because I don't want to be the only one working. So you guys, I got you some notes. We got your little scout books, you have pencils. So I'm gonna put you guys to work as well. So we're gonna um, model cognitive engagement through comics. We're going to um, think about activities that utilize comics-based pedagogy. We're going to um, share resources. So most of the activities that I do utilizing comics have come from various resources, different books. And I'm gonna share some of those. Um, and also I'd be interested in our Q&A time hearing from you what works well, what resources you would suggest. I think that's the best way is for you. Any of the activities that we do, take them, use them, modify them, make them better, and then tell me what you did. So that's sort of our plan today. So why do we use comics in classes? Um, I often will go into, um, I'm often called to go into high schools and middle schools and talk to librarians and teachers and even parents. And I go through this whole thing about See, I'm not moving, not moving. Um, I, I don't want to leave the mic. Oh, modeling, cognitive engagement, all of these things, because I have to convince parents that it's okay to use comics and, and teachers. It's very interesting to me, uh, not at my current institution, but at a previous institution, I proposed a, a course on comics. There's something about like, you know, comics, blah, 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 was the title. Um, and it was rejected from the curricula. But when I renamed it, multimodal composition and graphic <laughs> narratives. The description was the same. The learning outcomes were the same. Everything was exactly the same, but it got approved instantly. Uh, so you guys know what that's like. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Often when I go into high schools, I will talk a lot about visual literacy, visual rhetoric, multimodal composition, benchmarks, things like that. Um, and, I, and, and so I don't think I need in this room and this crowd to talk to you about how comics can be beneficial, but it's something that I'm very mindful of also with the students, whether I'm teaching comics or writing or rhetoric, I, I always invite them to ask me why, why are we doing this? And so I always try and tell them 
why why we're doing this. And of course, you, you guys know why, but I'm also happy to talk more about that later. Um, and I, I often bring in Ivan Brunetti, because um, I think he's amazing. And thinking about the way that um, comics really, I think, can be used both as a way of communicating, but also thinking through ideas. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Uh, and by the way, it's not going to be all me just yammering. I'm going to put you to work in a minute. But just for like some context and an overview. So when I first started teaching with comics, I was thinking, this is fun and amazing and fantastic. Uh, and I did more research and I reached out to collaborators like Ontario Garcia is um, one of my collaborators. He's a professor in education at Stanford. And Peter Carlson is a K-12 educator in Los Angeles. And unlike me, they actually know about education <laughs> and, and, and about um, educational theory. And so they taught me a lot. Like I knew about comics, but I didn't know. I mean, I could talk Green Lantern all day, but they knew about the educational theory, which was really helpful. Um, so together, we started working with these teachers and thinking about the places and ways we're seeing comics used in education. Um, and we sort of uh, talked about how we saw with comics pedagogy, there was teaching about comics. So we see classes like at Portland State, comics theory, comics history, uh, you know, comics are the focus. They are the subject. Not so much in K-12. Um, we don't see that as much, I think, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but mostly these sort of, you know, comics theory, comics history, more likely at the uh, university level when we do see them teaching with comics. Now, that is something that I do see more and more in different history, um, uh, political science classes at, at middle school and high school level. And so, for example, you might see uh, a social studies class reading March. Uh, as a companion text alongside other ones, or maybe Persepolis, or if it hasn't been banned, Mouse might be <laughs> in classes where they're teaching about the Holocaust. So there's uh, comics are entering in as texts alongside more traditional narrative text-based uh, different texts. And then teaching through comics. And that one I find especially interesting right now. And so that is a, examples of teaching through comics, using comics as a way of thinking through ideas. Uh, and this one is fascinating to me because I find it so beneficial uh, regardless of what subject. I might be teaching a traditional modern novel class, but we'll do comics exercises to help them think through what they think about great expectations. Or I've been in um, different uh, middle school, I was in a, helping in a middle school class where they were writing a, their, a, a comic about the life cycle of, a, of an otter or something like that. But it was a different way of thinking through these concepts using comics. So these are some different ways that I've noticed, different categories, um, comics. And again, here are some examples. When you're teaching about comics, you might have a focus on uh, different subject areas, um, teaching with comics, you might see March or Mouse in a classroom. Uh, comics pedagogy, teaching with comics, through comics. Um, so these are some of the resources that, that I really like. Um, and I draw from all of these resources and what I do. So comics as the subject. Uh, I will often start, um, regardless of whether I'm teaching about comics or with comics or through comics, I like to like to understand how do we do this. Um, I start at the very beginning, and I find it helpful regardless of how I'm using comics to have this sort of context and a foundation. Um, so what I do is um, I'm looking at the time. Um, I usually uh, give my students. Sorry, it's hard. It's hard for me not to move. Um, I will ask them to take a few minutes and define comics. Um, and so then I ask them, what is your definition of comics? I'm a little scared to do it in this room. <laughs> I'm a little bit scared. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, we, OK, let's, any, any folks want to share your definition? Yeah. Um, a series of uh, images meant to be read in a particular order intended for reproduction. Images read in a particular order 
What's the last part? Intended for reproduction. Intended for reproduction. Okay, interesting. Because you have these elements about you know reproduction, it should be shared, yeah. reproduced. Okay, so it can't be just a private promise for yourself. Uh, I don't know. That's I, I know, right? It's, that's a, I mean, yeah. Uh, right. That's an hour-long discussion, but yes, yeah, so right. But uh, but I, to me, yeah, that yeah. that is sometimes what separates it from fine art that uses the trappings of commerce. Got it. Okay. Well, why do you hate the family circle? <laughs> <laughs> why? Why? Uh, we only have an hour. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Any? Yes. A visual story in boxes. Visual story in boxes. Fantastic. Okay, over here, and then we'll go over there. Yes. Sequential storytelling with images and text. Sequential storytelling with images and text. Awesome. Yes? Yes. Yeah, similar thing. A combination of, uh, combination of visuals and uh, writing uh, in a sequence uh, with or without uh, the intention of creating a narrative. Okay, well, I don't know. Combination of, <laughs> of text and images, text and then in, images in a sequence, in a sequence. Uh, with or without the necessity of creating a narrative. With or without the necessity of creating a narrative. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. We'll do one more in the back. Yes. Yes. Me? Yes, you have <laughs> your hands. I thought you had your hands. I thought you had your hands. Images in sequence. Um, <laughs> damn it. Uh, this is bad. I'm a professor. Damn it. Okay. Uh, uh, with the objective of telling a story. With the objective of telling a story. Okay. We could do this all day, right? Like we only have 45 minutes. I love this. I love that there's difference of opinion. And we could say, what about reproduction? Can it be for yourself? Does it have to have text? Does it have to be a sequence, right? These are all questions that are really, I think, important. So I always give my students like the definition that, you know, everyone likes to criticize and or <laughs> right? I mean, like, so I give them the definition from Scott McCloud. I give them definitions from Will Eisner, uh, you know, arrangement of pictures or images, narrative story, which are all types of idea. Uh, cultural idiom, publishing genre, set of narrative conventions, kind of writing the easiest words and pictures, the literary genre, and text. Whew, that's a lot, <laughs> right? Um, so, let me go back. So the reason I do that with the students is because I want them to know that this is a discussion that is happening right now. And we don't have to agree. That's okay, you know? I want them to feel like they're a part of this conversation, that it's happening, that I'm not looking for, it's not like Jeopardy. They're, I'm not looking for that right answer, that there will be a prize at the end. This is an ongoing conversation, and comics is so uh, exciting to me because we are having these discussions, and they, as scholars and students, can be a part of it. Uh, and, and, I, and I like them to see everyone in here, we have differences of opinion. These folks, they have differences, and that's okay. Um, and so I like to have them be a part of that conversation. And it's a good foundation. So again, and you can do this, this is so much fun to do in your classes because you get to see where they're coming from. And a lot of them will say, I, I know it when I see it, you know, like it's really, it's hard to articulate it, right? So that is one thing. Um, another thing that I will do is, um, obviously this is from All Star Superman. And I have, Ben, can I have you just like give one of, I don't have enough for everybody, but like one for each row so you can see it a little bit better. So one thing that I do when I'm starting out teaching comics, again, regardless of whether it's with, about, or through, um, I start by having them read a comics page. And this is just a great example um, that I like to use because uh, most folks are familiar with this story, right? Um, not everyone, but um, even if you're not, I think it's a, it's a story that you can get um, from this one page. So I will give the students a page and I will ask them, what, what do you notice? What do you see? So again, I will ask you guys, thank you. Um, and I, these are just examples if it's too hard to see up here, you guys can share. What do you notice when you look at this page? What jumps out at you? Color, right? Those kind of rich, the reds, the oranges. Yes? It's a comparison of uh, 
two different couples on the same page. Right, the two couples and the, and the way they're both looking in different directions and there's that parallel between the second and the fourth panel, that parallelism. And then you have the parallelism between the fir first and the third. Other, yeah, yes. Just uh, eight words, uh, two per panel. Right, it's so, the concision about how few words and how powerful those words, it reminds me of poetry. You have to get it down to, you just distill this idea down to its essence. Ben, did you ever have? I was gonna say, I noticed that everything is drawn with uh, black contour outlines. Right. Uh, which is a, a description of the content of it rather than the form, which is something no, none of the definitions that anybody right. put forward actually addressed. Right. You know, so like, it looks like, it looks like comics. Right, looks like comics, you're no noticing the black contour. Another reason why I like doing this with my students and in class is because you get folks who are artists talking about form and how it's done. You get English majors like me talking about parallelism and point of view and things like that. And so it's you get this sort of um, all of these different perspectives from your students, which is really cool because they see things I won't see. And together we see more. Um, yes, in the back, in the plaid shirt. For me, it's the familiarity with stories and retelling the same story again. I'm a historian, so I know it's like, oh, they have the same. Right, right, and also we can talk about how does your uh, own history, that cultural situatedness, that cultural context, how does that help or hinder our interpretation of this story? Yes. Other folks, yes. It looks to me like they are boiling it down to a very succinct uh, approach that we all know, it's an assumption we all know the story. So here are this quick right right so it's a very succinct four panels how many words was it two four six eight eight words yeah. right it is definitely we're talking about drawing on a shared social context which may or may not be accurate i have used this example and i've had students um, who are exchange students or students international students who aren't immediately sure i mean superman is international but i have had students who aren't as familiar um and it also depends on the on the page that i choose yes in the back Alternation between a distant shot and a close-up. Right, the alternation, the close-up, the faces, the far away. Yes, Sydney? I think that the, that contrast, the fact that the panels are all the same exact size, helps size up. Right, that they're all the panels are all the same size. There's that rhythm and that kind of regularity to it. Yes, so we'll, we'll do a uh, plan and then we'll go. Okay. Okay. I was just noticing the, that they're all backlit. Like, <gasps> Yeah. <laughs> Backlit. Very cool. I have seen that and I've never noticed that before. Thank you. Yes. So going along with the idea of rhythm, all of the images are horizontal or horizontally are um, centered in the in the middle of each panel, which also slows down the reader to like look at details more because yeah. it makes a, it, it, it slows down the, the way that you read it. Also, uh, with the parallel with the two couples, they're both wearing the same colors, and all of you know, all of their colors are the same. And then uh, the woman is in the front, and the man is in the back. The red is the right. Yeah, you guys are good. <laughs> You're so good. Yeah, let's do one more. I guess I'm not seeing any of this next. I, I think especially I'm more focused on the emotions that are coming through. You yeah, that's cool. Have, like the rain, the love, desperation, hope. Ruin. It's like the spectrum of human emotion in four panels of the human experience. I think that's awesome. You're focused on that human expression, the expressions on their faces, that that just sadness and grief. And the artist is so amazing because you can see that expressed so well. And then there's this sort of wonder. Let me do one more. You had your hand up in the back. Yeah. Uh, all of the text except for the second panel is set to the right of center, um, which kind of sets that second panel apart. Wow, I never noticed that. See, that's why I love doing this. Because selfishly, every time I bring in a different page, I learn too. I love teaching comics because I learn so you know I learn something new every time. Uh, and it's so cool because we have all these folks focusing on different things. Uh, when I do this with a class, it sometimes students are like, "Oh, I don't know anything about comics." Let's say I'm teaching the modern novel or something, but they find that when they actually look at the comic page. They have a lot to say. They actually, they're 
I find that our students are highly skilled in visual rhetoric and interpreting these signs, symbols, colors. They may not have the same vocabulary that a comic scholar will, but they know. They know what the colors, you know, how that makes them feel, the expressions, the language. So even in classes where I'm, it's either where maybe I'm in a high school or I'm with a group of English majors. Um, they're so difficult, those English majors. I'm joking because I was an English major. Uh, but um, they have really highly developed sense of uh, visual literacy and, and so forth. So we do this kind of exercise. And then what we do is I start translating it into formalist analysis. And I say, you guys are doing formalist criticism. And uh, hats off to Charles Hatfield. I borrowed from him. Uh, he has a great handout about this. And we'll start with the page, just like I just we did just now. Um, and then we look at panel to panel, talking about obviously those transitions, and then within panels. And this is all knowledge stuff you guys know. So we look at page composition. We look at panel to panel. And I'm kind of breezing through this because you guys know all this. Um, and then we look at panel composition. So what I would do in my classroom is um, I would put them in small groups with like a different page or double page spread each group. And I would ask them to apply the vocabulary. And we would go through talking about McLeod's transitions and you know what I mean? I'd be expanding on all the vocabulary, but you guys, you got that. Um, but giving them that vocabulary, you know, this is the balloon, these are the panels, these are the transitions you'll see, giving them that shared terminology, shared vocabulary. I put them in small groups, have them try it on their own. And then I also ask them to think about applying it to other contexts. I love doing this when I'm teaching visual rhetoric in a political year, like an election cycle, because we can take apart advertisements, we can take those posters apart. If you dare entering into that political arena, it's really interesting to think about um, how do you analyze um, other other texts, visual texts. So that's what I would do in a classroom. But ugh, we have so little time. But you know, okay. Now I'm going to put you to work, and. You don't have to, but it's, it's fun, I promise. Um, so what I will do in my classes, again, whether I'm teaching comics, literature, or whatever I'm teaching, I usually start out class by doing an activity, an exercise, because uh, I feel like you can't really teach through, with, about comics unless you try it. I'm a terrible artist. That's, I always do the exercises with them so that they can see that I'm a terrible artist. No, so that they can see that that's okay. It's not about that, it's about learning. How can I teach them about these things unless they get a sense of them? So um, if you have, and if you're willing, you have a little scrapbook and a piece of paper. Um, this is an activity that I do adapted from Drawing is Magic. Um, and what I do is, I'll give you a minute, I'm gonna do it too. Um, just write your name on some scratch paper. Okay, okay. now it's gonna get interesting. Now I'm going to ask you to write your name in different styles because we're thinking about comics. We're thinking about right, you know, teaching comics, lettering. Can you write your name in an angry style? What does that look like? Your name in an angry style. I see some folks are like, yes, I do have an angry style. It is ready. <laughs> What about when you get that done? How about a superhero style? Do you have a superhero lettering style? How about freezing? Is there a cold? What do cold letters look like? This one's really hard. If you get to it, frumpy. I don't know what that looks like. I admit it. I know what it is. I think I am it, but I don't. I don't know how to uh, do that letter.
The last one I have, I think, is nervous, if you have nervous lettering. I actually think all of mine look nervous at this point. <laughs> I'm sort of shaky and nervous. Oops. Okay, so while you guys are working on that, uh, just a couple comments. Again, this is something I would do in a class where I'm teaching about comics. Um, if we're going to talk about lettering, I think it's important to know how hard it is to convey emotion. Maybe then you read some pages from Sandman, a little Todd Klein, take a look at these different ways of conveying emotion with the lettering. Um, and again, whenever I ask my students to do something, I do it also. So I was doing my name in these different styles. So that is an activity I might do for a class about comics. I think it's really important to do if we're going to ask them to study them. OK. Um, I don't know if I can correct you, but I did want to yeah. get offering related to this, because I love that. I, yeah, yeah. I'm a comics teacher as well, um, but not from a sort of academic perspective. Yeah. And uh, I really enjoy, I mean, you were talking about writing things in different styles. I sometimes will say, like, write your name, now draw your name. Okay, so you're, you're, another activity is to write your name and then draw your name. I'm just repeating it so other folks can make sure they hear. That's a great idea. It'd be fun to see what they come up with. Well, because the difference between writing and lettering, it's like writing another to draw letters. Right. And then do you think the result of that drawer? Right. <laughs> but you are drawing when you do those styles, uh -huh. and you're getting that name of, like, you're doing part right now. Absolutely. No, that's a great idea. I'm going to steal that. Draw your name. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, oftentimes when I teach writing, I will say, I want you to illustrate your writing process. And they're like, what does that mean? And I'm like, I don't know. What does it mean to you? And then they're like, then they say, I hate you. Um, but it's really cool because when I say illustrate your writing process, some people will draw a cartoon, some people will do a comic, some people will do uh, a list. Some people do a Venn diagram, and I love doing that because I want to see how they interpret it. So saying something like, draw your name, illustrate your name. I like, yeah. I'm so mean, I like to mess with them. But, it's, it, but if they ask why, I'll say, because I want to show that diversity in perspective and value these multiple intelligences. So this is, I'm not going to do it because we don't have enough time. Another example um, adapted from Sunny Brown. Write in uh, the following in different fonts, using different lettering styles, rebellion, fear, sickness, balance. Those are fun ones to do. Oh, I call them lightning exercises. Just, just, <laughs> just as an excuse to, right? Like, play with those. So, you know, you can take these, think about rebellion, how do you do that, and so forth. Okay, and then another one. I know, these are so much fun. I wish we had all the time. Um, like, how do you do, I, um, I feel, what is that? Two inches tall, togetherness is beautiful, leave me alone, her dream is expensive. And I will say, like, putting these slides together, I felt frustrated because I was limited by the fonts, like, of available to me. And so sometimes we'll talk in class about how technology can constrain us. And when you're using these tools like pens, watercolors, things like that, um, uh, you have so much more freedom. Th this is a constraint. Um, and thinking about these different constraints, because I, I think about the tools of composition and how they change the ways we compose. But this is another example of an activity that I will do. Um, I switch gears a little bit and talk about teaching with comics. I'm not going to spend a ton of time about on it, but just to reference, this is another trend that I see a lot. Um, folks doing close reading of a text, as I said, maybe reading mouse closely in a history class. Uh, we, I was using the example of Superman. You might use uh, Superman text um, in a lot of different ways. You could talk about history of comics. You could talk about history of immigration, all kinds of things. Um, yeah, Superman's immigrant story. Um, that there's a way of bringing that in. Um, all kinds of different ways you can bring in these texts as a window into other disciplines. 
And I really like doing that and seeing that because uh, we know that students learn differently and they process differently and having different types of texts. Maybe we have the traditional text-based literacy, but we also do some podcasts, we do some documentaries, and we do some comics. And I think that is a really great way to reach students. Uh, and I am often called to come into other professors' classes who are teaching a comic in their class for the first time, and that's a lot of fun for me. Because um, we do those close readings of pages and people say, wow, there is so much going on, I hadn't realized. Um, so I think this is a trend that I see, which is very exciting. The other trend um, that I really am very excited about is comics as a way of thinking through ideas. So this is adapted from the amazing Ivan Brunetti's book, Cartooning. Uh, and this is an activity that I have used with great success in my literature classes. And I've adapted it from Brunetti. He didn't design it necessarily for literature class, but it works so well. So I'm going to just share it with you guys. I recommend that you give it a try because it's really fun. OK, so take a moment. I know this is a horrible thing to ask you. Choose one of your, I know you can't choose one, right? But choose one of your favorite text-based novels, OK? I'm going to do Pride and Prejudice. Spoiler, OK. Then. This is also really evil to ask of you. Summarize it in a sentence. You can have like two sentences, okay? Two or three. If you're picking Ulysses, you do what you must. give you not much time I'm gonna give you because we don't have much time I can give you like two minutes to draw that novel <laughs> in four panels four panels don't hate me If it was in class, I would give you more time. I'm just going to give you another minute to finish up. Activity is to try and draw your favorite text-based novel in one panel. 
one panel. Okay, while you're working on that, I will talk about why and how I do this. Um, I love to do this because we're talking about concision. Um, this kind of activity asks the students to distill a text down to its essence. What are the four most important scenes, the four most important moments, and then ultimately, what is the most important one? And sort of thinking it through, I love that this activity requires them to think differently to whether it's text based, it could be a movie, but think about what are the most important ideas. And, it, and it's also great to share these because not everyone, if you're all doing the same text, if you're all using one text, thinking about what are what it, they think are the most important ideas. I have my uh, Pride and Prejudice and I have, it's my panel, I have like a stick figure Darcy and a stick figure um, Lizzie Bennett, and she says, I hate you. And he says, me too. And then she says, actually, I love you. And he says, same sees. So, right, uh, it's, it's really, I think, a great way of thinking through. I also love it because when you look at the Brunetti text, he does it with um, Holden Caulfield um, and Catcher in the Rye, and he distills it down to this perfect little, um, little scene. And he also does it just so well. So, um, let's see. That is an example. Any questions or comments before I talk a little bit about? Yeah. Uh, for that activity, what if your students say that I don't have a favorite novel, or it's hard to think about it? They may have read it maybe three times, and they're like, "Oh, I don't know." Right. Well, honestly, if I was doing it in class, I would be more likely to do it where all have the same text, <laughs> or I could supply them with a, something they know. Because we're not all reading the same book, I just let you choose. But I might do it in a, in a literature class. Just say, okay, we've all read this story. Um, and then we're all on the same. And then you can get them into small groups or pairs to talk about it too, which is really fun. Uh, I'm curious how, how frequently does somebody end up picking, I, I ended up picking one panel and extrapolating on that yeah. from the four. Is that a frequent occurrence or do people tend to shifts into something entirely new. Uh, and the question was just about whether people use the one of the panels from the four and then make it the, the last panel. In my experience, that's fairly common. Um, and that's one thing that I'll talk about with the group is, is ask them, what did you prefer? The four panel or the one panel or the text description? Which one was easiest for you? Which one do you think was most accurate? And so it's, for me, I'm so tech, I, I think in text and others, think an image and we talk about that. Which one comes easily, which one is difficult, which one we think is more accurate. There's one more question then I'll. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to reading your book about Linda Berry because I love that she uh, encourages people who don't normally draw. Yes. How do you encourage, for example, English students that are really uncomfortable with drawing? So yes, the question was about how do you encourage students who are uncomfortable drawing drawing? Um, as I said before, I always draw with them and I am very, very bad. And I always share. If you have a document camera, you know, like you can share what you do. Not to say you're bad, but I am. But um, I, I do tell them it's not going to be graded. This is not 10 minutes, perfect. Okay, so um, it's not gonna be graded. This is all about us taking risks and experimenting. And I talk, if I need to, about multimodal literacy. I talk about multiple intelligences. And sometimes that framework of understanding helps people. But, but I think the thing that helps the most or the things that help the most is saying, you will not be graded on your art. Just, just the doing of it, the process. And then sharing my own work. Um, and just being like, it's, it's about the learning. It's not about the, the art. But it's also kind of cool because oftentimes there'll be some ringers 
Um, even in a, a literature class, there'll be Ringer's artists, and they have a chance to shine. Maybe a really shy student will have a chance to show their amazing work, um, and that's really fun to get different students because not you know not everyone's vocal, and it's fun to get them the chance to show what they can do. Okay, I'm gonna do a really quick recap, and then we'll end with questions and ideas because you guys are amazing. As I mentioned, I talked a little bit about teaching about comics, like lettering, thinking through that formalist analysis. Um, if we're lucky enough to teach a comics like I can about comics theory. I love to see comics incorporated alongside other class, other texts, teaching with classes in all sorts of dis disciplines. You see them in science. There's some great comics about climate change, some amazing comics in different science, history, political science. And then I love to bring teaching through comics, whatever the age level, whatever the discipline. It doesn't have to be a whole unit. It can be an activity you do for 20 minutes to inspire discussion. So again, um, these teaching about comics, mostly see them in history, comic studies, sometimes in composition classes, um, teaching with comics, sometimes it's the central content, sometimes supplemental, some examples. Teaching through comics, I love doing this, processing tools, the learners are generating the content, and I love that project-based learning. And these are some resources that I found super helpful, the Sketch Note Notebook, Doodle Revolution, Cartoony. There's new books coming out every day and I am borrowing, stealing, adapting all the time. So I'm hoping that this presentation has given you some ideas for using comics in your own classroom. And I'm eager to open up the discussion uh, to your questions, ideas, and uh, resources. So we have like eight minutes left for Questions, comments, resources, Andy? Um, going back to your, like, your early definite, asking students the definition of comics, I, I mean, this is more of a comment, but I, I, I try that with my students too. Um, I have such a range of, of ex student experiences with comics that, that when I first tried the way you did it, I got so many students saying, I, I don't know. Yeah. And so I started giving them comics on the first day, yeah. which is also a good way to like, get students to sign up for your class. And I find out okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's free stuff. Um, and I, so I try, you know, I occasionally end up getting doubles of things that yeah. I'm buying because I forgot that I bought them initially and buying you know, these, these, many of those. Um, and then ask them, how do you know this is a comic? Mm -hmm. Rather than give me your definition of comic, then we come up with a definition of comics from, from that. Idea. That's a great idea. So giving them some comics and saying, how do you know, how do you know what makes this a comic? That's a great idea. Yes, thank yeah, you. I did similar things uh, for one of the professors here at Ohio State on military historian, so it's not quite the same, but one of the things he asked in his class at uh, <laughs> start is he would show them uh, you give them definitions of war, what military historians have defined mm -hmm. war as over, over the years. And then he shows them slides of different images. So it can be, you know, Napoleonic combatants standing across from one another in the firing lines, mm -hmm. and then Civil War combat, World War II combat, the terrorist attacks on 9 11, mm -hmm. uh, the war on drugs, and these other, you know, all these mm -hmm. different photos. And he asked them at the end, you know, how do you know which of these is war? What's your definition of war? Do you find that just as helpful? Like, do you find asking the question, what do you think of comics, or you know, how do you find comics, or showing the material helps more? Or do you think there's some use to asking the question after, as Andy suggested, after you've given them some material to work with? I honestly, I would try all the ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> See what happens. You know, I, I, I sometimes will have the same class back to back. I don't know if you guys have had this experience. And I'll do the same lesson, and it's completely different in each class. And I'm like, oh, it's not about me. It's about them. So um, I would try it both ways. Um, that activity, um, the, the, my colleagues who, actually, who are high school teachers, they do it differently. And sometimes they will scaffold, um, have them do the images first and then do. So I had you write a text-based novel five minutes and then, um, and then do an image. Sometimes they'll do the image first and then the text. Um, if it makes sense to you, it'll, I think, make sense to them. So all of these, I say, adapt them for your class, for your 
pedagogy for your goals and, and let me know how it goes. Absolutely. Okay. So we'll do it over here and then we'll go over to Craig. Yes. Um, what uh, tips or recommendations for like resources do you have for someone who wants to pitch uh, more comic oriented curriculum in their school? Buzzwords. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm being flippant. Really, it depends on your context. You know what I mean. Um, depending on what institution you're at, um, what kind of comics course you're proposing. I had to learn, my training is in rhetoric, and so I had to learn to be mindful of my audience and give them the language that made sense to them. You know, talking about multimodal liter literacy worked. So, um, and it's not a lie, it is what we do, <laughs> right? So I think being aware of your audience, and, I, and also, um, when I go into high schools, I think about what the, the parents want, what the teachers want in terms about um, you know, engaging readers and, and things like that. So it kind of depends on your context. Um, I think there are some, I think it would be helpful to, you know, like Nick Suzanis on his website, Spin We Cut has a nice resource of different comics courses that have been taught um, at universities. And you can look at the sample syllabi and see how other people have framed it. And I'm always help, happy to share what I've done because um, sometimes it can be helpful to see how others have framed it for their institutions. Yeah, uh, Craig, and then we'll go over here. Yeah, I just have a question about a couple of things that we did during your presentation. I really like the idea of doing the four panels and mm -hmm. one panel, but I was wondering, it seems to me that you started your con the conversation by showing that scene from All Star Superman. Right. Have you ever tried to sort of come in and say, okay, you've read the origin of Superman, now boil it down to four panels and then showing them the Morrison uh, quite lean example, or would yeah. that be too intimidating? So the, the question was, have I taken the Superman panel and just, or had that, and have them read it and then try and distill it down? No, I'm not that mean, Craig. I haven't done this. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it would be really interesting. I haven't tried it. Um, no, I haven't tried it. It would be very interesting to, to see if all those different interpretations and then show that one, it would be really fun. You know, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes, you had a comment yeah, question? So I, I, I think the kind of the framework um, for kind of introducing comics, I think is great. Um, but let, like, let's say you're reading a comic in class, you're reading a graphic novel in class for a couple of weeks. What does the learning look like for those two weeks? Like, um, you know, what would that look like in class? Uh, so the question was about what would the learning look like each day in class as you're reading the comic? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny because when I first started teaching, I had no training in education. So I had like pages and pages of notes. And then I actually started working with education professors. And I was like, oh, you need like a lesson plan with objectives and stuff. <laughs> so, um, you know, every day in my class, we usually start with an activity. It's usually a making or a doing activity. Um, and then maybe some. I'm not good at lecture, sorry. Um, so, you know, like we'll have some lecture and then it's small group discussions. That's usually what my class looks like. And, it, and every day has a different sort of objective. Um, sometimes we're focused more on content. Sometimes we're focused more on form. Um, and it really, it really depends on the day. Um, but it's similar to what we would do in a, in a literature class. You know, every day in my class, we do some writing, we do some activities. We do some, maybe a little bit of lecture, and we do a little bit of discussion. I'm very predictable. Um, so my classes look very similar each, each day. So, um, and again, if you want, I'm also happy you can email me. I'm skirtly at pdx.edu, and I can send you my lesson plans, as messy as they are. And you can see, don't, don't take them as great, but I mean, like, I'm happy to share what I do on a, on a daily basis. Yes. Okay, so um, I'm a teaching artist at the Toledo Museum of Art, mm -hmm. and we work with seniors. And I would love to do teach comics to seniors. However, we have a couple um, like roadblocks, like their mobility, so right? Like and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious as to how you would kind of approach introducing it to them in terms of the accessibility, and also in terms of some of them may feel like. It was a great question talking about possibly um, teaching comics with a, a senior citizens, older older folks who might have um, 
mobility issues and things like that, different roadblocks. Um, one thing that I often do at, at the beginning of a class is I do a survey and I find out if there are issues, how I can assist with any of those kinds of issues. Okay, we're wrapping up. This will be the last question. Um, so I will do sort of a survey and find out how they feel about comics, what kind of, you know, mobility issues, what kind of roadblocks they're encountering, and then sort of outside of class, because nobody wants to be called out in class. We'll figure it out, like, how can I make this work for you? And I have a really great partner in our Disability Resource Center, um, and I, I work with them, and they have, you know, talked about sometimes we've had students who will do things on an iPad as opposed to, you know, or maybe they bring in, I have had students bring in watercolors or do things in a different way. And my Disability Resource Center has been really great about finding uh, ways to make the, the activities accessible for everyone. That's a great question. Thank you so much. We're out of time and I hope you guys will keep in touch. I'm Susan Kirtley and I'm at Portland State and thank you so much for being good sports and for being here. Thank you.